Hi. Well, uh, welcome to uh, to the uh, nuclear engineering department here at UC Berkeley. I'm uh, Peter Hosman, the department chair. Um, and I was going to give you a little bit of an introduction uh, to our department and uh, activities uh, we have ongoing. So normally you would uh, see, of course, uh, the campus and, and the Californian uh, weather, if you're not from California, uh, and get to experience the Bay Area. Unfortunately, this time we have to start off doing this remotely, but I'm confident that uh, uh, in uh, several months, a uh, few months, uh, this will be resolved and uh, we will get to see each other in person since uh, since you're going to spend, of course, uh, several years here. Um, so welcome to, to Berkeley and uh, to our department. Now, uh, the nuclear engineering department at UC Berkeley is intrinsically tied to the nuclear uh, enterprise. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the location has been uh, has been uh, tied to nuclear engineering for a long time, even before our department existed. Uh, so, uh, you know, even uh, in the early 1900s, almost 100 years ago, uh, Jay Oppenheimer was a professor here at UCB, not in our department because our department didn't exist back then, uh, but uh, he is, of course, known to the nuclear folks as being uh, the, lead, the scientific lead for uh, the Manhattan Project at the time later on. Uh, later and also Ernesto Lawrence became, uh, came to UCB uh, when the Lawrence Berkeley lab was founded and he uh, built the first cyclotron here in Berkeley which allowed the discovery of numerous elements on the periodic table right here uh, and for, for that also Berkeley is, and, and California is mentioned uh, in the periodic table for uh, two elements which uh, of course is it's very, very uh, rare and, and uh, uh, honorful that we got to mention there. Um, and then our department was actually founded in, in the late 50s uh, as a spin-off sort of, of mechanical engineering. Uh, and, uh, and we have been, uh, you know, uh, going strong ever since. Uh, so they actually built a building for us at the time, as you can see in this image here. Um, and underneath what used to be a parking lot here, that's where there used to be uh, there was a, a trigger reactor, uh, and these experimental halls still exist today. Now, the trigger reactor was taken out. Uh, obviously, we're sitting on an earthquake uh, uh, area and so on, uh, but uh, the laboratory still exists, and hope you will get to see them uh, you know, soon when, when the pandemic uh, is, is over uh, and people can have in-person meetings again. Um, but uh, we also surrounded, not, not just on behalf of our own nuclear history, but we're also surrounded by nuclear facilities. Of course, I already mentioned Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, five minutes up the street, really, uh, with cyclotron and synchrotron and lots of nuclear facilities. Um, and uh, then we have a Slack, uh, you know, maybe about, well, depending on traffic, uh, uh, anywhere between an hour or two hours drive from here in the South Bay. Um, in, in, in Stanford, we have uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, maybe 45 minutes uh, away from us. And uh, we have Sandia National Laboratory, also about 45 minutes. And we are really sort of in the middle of all of this. And many of our uh, students get to experience these national lab environments, uh, get, to, get to do internships, get to work there, get, and, and, and ultimately getting jobs there later down the road. In, in their career. So, so we really can utilize that. I think we are the only university who really has this kind of resources um, um, next in next door, literally. Now in our department, uh, we are trying to cover all of our um, um, areas of, uh, of nuclear engineering, uh, that be it reactor design, fusion, bionuclear, radiation detection, thermal hydraulics, chemistry, materials, nuclear waste, physics, um, non-proliferation. All these things are covered by different faculty. We, we currently have uh, 10, or actually nine and a half uh, full-time uh, employees as the number to go by, but there's more heads here. And that's because we heavily leverage particular Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, as, a, as, a, uh, um, as a facility. And, and many scientists from there support us either in part-time or full-time 
uh, either as an adjunct professor or professor in residence or, or as a split position. So we have many more resources than what a, what a faculty number of 10 really would suggest. Um, this is going to be also seen in, in, in people who lecture in our department or are still engaged in the research, uh, be it, you know, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory scientist, I want to highlight particular uh, Thomas Schenkel here, uh, who is actually the division uh, director at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab at the moment, uh, at the accelerator division, for example. Um, or retired uh, uh, nuclear power experts from nuclear power plants or uh, accelerator and laser expert here, Carl Schroeder. All these, all these people are teaching, helping us teach classes. All these people help us getting engaged deeper in the nuclear enterprise and in the nuclear uh, facilities nearby. Now, our uh, uh, de de department could not uh, work, of course, without really dedicated staff. So um, Kirsten, who is here on the line, Kirsten uh, is our student service. Uh, manager, and you have Alan speaking a little bit later today as a, as a safety officer. We also have uh, AJ Goopser, our laboratory manager, who helps us uh, running laboratories and make sure things, things uh, are working right. Um, Brandon helps us with the front office and particular communications. Uh, Christina uh, also helps us uh, with uh, event planning, and Hannah being really uh, uh, the assistant to the chair or, or and doing uh, personnel cases and Vicky overseeing all of our staff uh, and make sure the machinery runs runs smoothly for everybody. Now, uh, being in Berkeley, of course, all these uh, faculty, staff and students get heavily, uh, all, not just na engaged in national labs, but also in industry. So we have several uh, companies here by Oakland, I guess Oakland is not on the, on, the, on the slide here, but Deep Isolation being a, a startup company trying to uh, uh, building uh, um, uh, waste processing uh, facilities or waste storage facilities, Kairos Power building new kinds of reactors, uh, and then Rachel, who is uh, going to uh, speak with you in a minute here, uh, just finished a, a, a wonderful uh, appointment at RPE, uh, trying to uh, foster out of from the government uh, building and advancing of nuclear technology. So all these uh, these resources, be national lab or industry or even government engagement, is something uh, we hope you get to utilize the next few years uh, by getting engaged in our department. Now, we also have numerous uh, centers around uh, education and research. I would like to highlight uh, the NSSC, which is the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. This is now the 10th year of this uh, of the center, uh, which uh, uh, has over over this ten year period, you know, more than three hundred seventy students. Many, many uh, um, universities and national labs are engaged in this, making uh, Berkeley reach out far, far, far beyond uh, the Bay Area and really across the country uh, and uh, leverage nuclear science and technology taught here to the benefit of nuclear science and security. Um, and uh, uh, we also are actually a nuclear science user facility. So since also about 10 years, actually I think it's nine years now, uh, we are part of the nuclear science user facility. So we bring in scientists and researchers from all over the country, uh, right into Berkeley using our equipment, our hardware, our technology, our uh, knowledge and know-how to help uh, Foster nuclear technology uh, as a whole, and so we, so we host uh, several of these proposals a year, uh, coming here and, and, and scientists coming here to use uh, our our facilities and knowledge. And then, since about three years, we also uh, uh, a core facility for the Energy Frontier Research Center out of the uh, Office of Science, out of the Department of Energy, um, and. Um, we are trying, setting off, the, trying to understand the transport under reactor conditions. How do things move under reactor conditions? Um, and all these other, it's, it's, it's led by Los Alamos with Berkeley being the co-lead and many other universities and, and facilities being part of this effort as well. Uh, 2020 uh, is 
it's a very exciting year. Of course, there's a lot of uh, unfortunate events uh, taking place, but there's also a lot of fortunate events uh, taking place, particularly for our department. We are just about, and it just came from there uh, literally 10 minutes ago, we're just about uh, to get delivered and then installed an accelerator with uh, 1, 1, 1.5 million volt uh, uh, vo uh, acceleration voltage. Uh, we are about to getting a new focus ion beam instrument uh, involved uh, uh, here is this, uh, installed probably before, well, next couple of months, really. It's getting delivered in a month. Um, we get a new a glove boxes installed uh, for uh, looking at molten salt uh, chemistry work and really expanded our lab space significantly the last few months. Um, and uh, and we're also bringing new faculty on board, being either as adjunct or regular. So, so lots of activities in 2020, despite all this uh, uh, um, hindering uh, coincidences here. But uh, we're very excited that we can use this time and really make a big, big progress here uh, to foster the advancement of the nuclear engineering department and nuclear science as a whole. Now, besides all the science and the educational aspects, I would like to highlight a few just fun activities that have been ongoing uh, before uh, the pandemic and now currently of still ongoing. Uh, I would like to point at the attention of, of an interesting project a few years ago where we discovered or rediscovered a sample in storage. And uh, uh, my uh, colleague Rick Norman at the time was able to identify this, this sample, which was literally found in the waste. Uh, being the actually very first sample of uranium-239 ever produced being uh, of enough mass that it could be weighed. So this is, we actually rediscovered the sample from 1942, uh, which was produced at the time and uh, was still here. And so we keep it actually, and at some point we want to make it as a display uh, for students so people can benefit from that. The same technology which allows us to identify historical artifacts allows us also to look at fallout debris, for example, and create these wonderful images of what a fallout may look like uh, from nuclear explosions. Uh, and so that's beautiful uh, experiments ongoing and just make really great images. Um, Particular highlight also uh, would like to uh, uh, a project uh, uh, DoseNet and, and Redwatch. Uh, those are spearheaded by Ellie Hanks and by uh, uh, Kai Vedder's team, and it's an outreach effort to establish uh, uh, radiation monitoring systems all over the country, all over the world, really, and have a network where it sends it back, uh, and one can in real time see what are the radiation levels. Uh, this is, uh, people get to build their own detectors um, and they get installed at various uh, schools, for example, to create a, a large network. Similar to, I believe now with a, a, a air quality monitoring, I think purple net it's called or similar, uh, for air quality monitoring, same for radiation here is the idea. So uh, anybody want to get engaged in any of these activities, uh, you know, we always look for students uh, really, really wanting to make a difference in any in, in, in these activities here. Um, we also, of course, have, uh, when we have in-person meetings, this was obviously pre-pandemic, and we hope to get back to this uh, condition uh, soon as well. Numerous events, numerous conferences uh, where people get together. We host uh, larger events of 50 to 100 people at a time, uh, where we scientists from all over the world really come here to learn about nuclear science and technology from and with us. And if all of this is not enough, uh, we also have a blacksmithing club. Uh, if somebody is interested in learning how to bladesmith and blacksmith things, including uh, blades and other uh, uh, tools, uh, we are about ready to start for the 2021 competition. It's a national wide competition. Uh, of, from uh, the Mining Materials and Metals Society, some of our, led by our department actually, uh, and uh, we're always looking for students getting engaged in, engaged in these activities. And then if you think uh, the Bay Area is all about uh, beaches and, and, and I guess Golden Gate Bridge and fog, uh, we have quite a few students who, who make use of the wonderful nature out there. And actually one of our graduate students, Hevo, sent me this picture two weeks ago from his weekend trip. 
Uh, so social distancing as his finest, it's really him and, and uh, this, 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 uh, the sky and the mountains. Uh, not too far from here, really. So these activities are obviously open to anybody who, who comes here uh, and uh, joins us. So we really looking forward to have you here and to work with you in the coming years. Uh, and go Bears, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. You're muted, Kirsten. I think. Yeah, Kirsten, we can't hear you. Kirsten, now we can't see you either. Uh oh. Uh oh, yeah, well. Um, do any of the students have any questions? Comments? One thing I also would like to point out is if you have any interest in or want to learn more, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. It's uh, peterh at berkeley.edu anytime. Um, and uh, we can talk, of course, over Zoom or phone about anything, the department or otherwise. So uh, yeah, just uh, just let me know anytime. I guess we lost Kirsten. Not sure what to do about that. I can try to call it by phone. And see yeah, if... I can see her screen. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me see if I can figure this out here. Uh, uh, Caleb Henry, uh, you have a question? Uh, let me just call Kirsten quickly. Uh, all the time. Um, Hi, hey, Kirsten, we can't hear you or see you. We only see your screen. Yeah, I'm waiting for approval on here. So I'll log out and log back in. Okay, very good. Um, so Caleb, yeah, so we have uh, uh, lots of undergrad students. In fact, that's one thing I think we pride ourselves that any undergrad student who wants to get enga engaged in research can. Maybe not exactly in all the topics that, 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 that they're interested in, but, but in research for sure. So I can tell you that in the materials group, which is obviously what I do, um, I have right now seven undergrad students working on various topics. In fact, I just I have one senior who is very deeply engaged in research and he actually got permission to be in the lab even now during the pandemic. And he, I just saw him earlier sitting on the femtosecond laser and, uh, and cutting uh, uh, um, uh, devices for uh, radioactive microfluidics experiments. So, so he, you know, that, that's all very possible. It's always the question, how deeply does a student want to be, get engaged and, and to what level? So one thing I always tell students, I guess, at this point is that, you know, get engaged, right? So this is the time to, to get engaged in research and, and so on. Um, this is the time to, to really do it. Um, you know, it's, earlier is better than later. We, we work with freshmen as much as sophomore, any, any level, really. Um, I had students who are with me nine years, four years as undergrads and five years as grad students. Um, and they graduated uh, with more papers than than what I've seen in a long time. Some of them, and uh, so so, yeah, ab absolutely. We look forward to that. Have people get engaged in, in research, depending a little bit on the area, right? So we don't have all the areas in in the full depth, of course. Um, we don't have a tokamak reactor, for example. So if somebody wants to do that, well, we don't have that. Uh, but uh, uh, in any kind of uh, you know thing we have, we always look for engagement. In fact, it's so much that we uh, work a lot with students who are not even in our department. So from the six or seven students, undergrad students I have right now, 
uh, one is two of them are mechanical engineering and one is material science and, and nuclear uh, joint major. So we have, um, we, 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 we really want to work with undergrad. So yeah. I don't know. I think that's one of great things. I hope that answers your question, Kayla. Peter? Peter? Yes, but there's an echo somehow. Maybe it's me. I, I mean. Can you see my screen? Peter, does it make sense for, should I go while we're waiting for Kirsten or, oh, you're muted. Peter, you're muted. All right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I did that. People do this all the time, all day long. Um, uh, yes, you should go. Let me just answer quickly, Caleb, and Joy, one more comment. Um, you know, it's really important for undergrad students at this point that, you know, really the different maybe to, to high school is in, in some ways that you have to go and seek the engagement a little bit, right? So just go out, email the professors, uh, you know, see them when you can, uh, comment on, 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 and see them after class and what have you in a field you're interested in and try to get their advice. Um, we don't have like a structured program and, and a little bit on purpose because um, it's really people have to go out and do it on their desire, not the other way around. And so so uh, if, you, if you just email some people and say, hey, I want to get engaged in X, Y, Z, I'm sure people will answer, people will respond uh, and, uh, and, and you can, right? Um, but you have to just reach out. So feel free to reach out. Um, to, to get engaged in any way you would like. Okay, let's try a kiss. Kirsten, I still have an echo. Well, why don't you mute yourself, Kirsten, and Rachel, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Slaba. I'm the head undergraduate advisor, and I really appreciate your patience with us um, as we are using a platform none of us have ever used before, so it's a little clunky. Um, I'm gonna talk through um, some basic information about the curriculum and some resources um, for incoming freshmen and transfer students. Um, so first and foremost, everyone is welcome. Um, diversity is a defining feature of the University of California, and I'm actually gonna read this verbatim because I think it's important, and we embrace it as a source of strength. Our differences of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, socioeconomic status, abilities, experience, and more enhance our ability to achieve the university's core mission of public service, teaching, and research. The nuclear engineering department welcomes students, faculty, and staff from all backgrounds and wants everyone in the department to feel respected and valued. So one of the things that is helpful when you start is to really get a handle on what the curriculum is. We will, I believe, make all these slides available. So if you click on this link, it will take you to all the degree requirements. And on the next slide, I'm going to show a flow chart. For me, this is the easiest way to think about it. So I included the link to it directly because it can be a little hard to find the flow chart. So the things that are key is that the curriculum is both flexible and strict at the same time. Um, there are a lot of classes that you can choose, so you can choose according to your interest, but there are a lot of basic requirements, and that is an ABET, you know, all nuclear engineering programs have the same requirements. And it's important to keep track of what those core ones are, because some of them are offered only once a year. And so being really sort of forward looking about what courses you're going to need when can help you stay on track. This is the flow chart. I think this is really helpful to use because for me, like mapping out what's been done visually 
Um, if you just get a copy of this for yourself and cross them off when you've taken them, it can help make sure you like have done all the things in the right order. Because what's helpful is they have these little arrows for what are prerequisites to everything else so that you know, have I taken the right classes ahead of time? Um, and so many of them are specified. And then you see as you go further along, you have more options. You have a free elective, you have technical electives, and then sort of by your last year, you have a lot more. You can sort of take whatever's the most interesting because you've already done all the prereqs. Um, this is a map for the transfer curriculum. It doesn't have a flow chart in the same way um, because typically you will have come in with a whole bunch of different things. Kirsten, who you have met and hopefully will be able to get back on the line with not the echo of death at some point, um, is the student advisor. She knows a lot of the rules and details about all the kind of logistical and paperwork parts of um, being on campus. I'm the head undergraduate advisor, so I'm the one who can help with any questions that are related to like department curricula or like, does this technical thing, can I count it as that? I can help with some of those questions. Um, Shaniqua Butcher is the engineering student services academic advisor, and she's going to be your first point of contact for any curriculum questions because she knows the actual like campus wide rules. I know the things that are more like, does this can we sign off on this for the nuclear program? So like, I know the nuclear pieces, but Shaniqua knows the College of Engineering and the campus-wide pieces. So she knows like rules that I might not know. And then after you're here, um, you will have a specific professor who's assigned to you, who's available um, to answer questions. So I might be the person for some of you. Peter might be the person for some of you. Um, we have other faculty who you'll all have somebody. Um, Peter did talk about research opportunities. Here's some places to look. Um, there's an, I forget what URAP stands for, undergraduate research something. So here's a list of opportunities. Beehive is kind of like a job posting place. So you can go look for things by like keyword. Um, some opportunities are paid, some are for credit. Um, if you want to learn more about the different faculty in our department, you can go look at who works on what. Um, we all have research group meetings, so you can come reach out to some professor who's interesting to you, find out when the research meeting is, you can show up to that. Um, we have colloquium on Mondays at four, and that's where a different outside speaker comes in um, and talks about their research. So you can start seeing like, what are the different fields? What do people work on? What's interesting to you? Um, and we are, I, I think Rebecca will mention this as well. So the colloquium is Mondays. And now this year, sometimes I think on, I have to go look up when exactly this is, but there will be a follow on like discussion section um, for people who are more interested in talking to the speakers later in the week. Um, it's never too early to be involved in research. You don't have to be involved in research, um, It's a, but it's an option. Um, some other resources that you might want um, counseling and psychological services. There are a lot of different resources for students. And especially in this time where things are not normal, things can be more stressful, things can be differently stressful, please take advantage of those services if you need them. Um, if you need something that is an emergency, that is after business hours, there is a crisis line. Um, so this, the main one, uh, CAPS is during, you know, sort of like nine to five time frame. If you need something outside of those hours, there's a crisis line. There's also a, a resource that is um, like for students helping students. Um, there is a sexual violence and sexual harassment support structure. And if you are on campus, which you might be on campus, I don't know. There are also um, the Berkeley Police Department if you use a cell phone, call this 510 number to reach the police on campus. If you are on a landline on campus, which probably this will never happen, um, is when you would dial 911, but otherwise dial this 510 number. And remember, actually this whole thing is supposed to, you know, you will learn a lot, but also hopefully you enjoy it along the way. 
So remember, as you go along, have some fun, take a step, take a pause to go enjoy some time. And I um, left this blank because this is where pictures of you and your time at Berkeley go. So this is sort of the beginning of your journey. And this is where you get to fill in the memories to make it what you want. So I will stop here and take questions. Thank you, Rachel. Um, if anybody has any questions, please use the chat feature since I believe you can't speak actually. Uh, and Peter, we'll send the slides out to everybody, right? So they'll have all those links themselves. Yeah. Um, so the question is, are advisors currently available to meet with students? So if you have any questions now, um, reach out to me. Um, I'll type the email address in here. Um, and then Kirsten would know at what point you get your specific advisor assigned to you, but I don't think that happens for a couple more months. So you will have somebody assigned you specifically, but before then um, you can reach out to me. Yeah, so the time, I think Laura is right. Basically, when you're starting to get ready for registration for the spring semester is when you'll get your assignments of who, who your faculty advisor is. Okay. Any other questions, somebody? I guess we're we'll waiting for uh, Kirsten to uh, fix the echo thing. I guess maybe we want to have the students going in between. At this point, Shaniqua should also be available. Great. I guess on the agenda, what was a? Uh, I guess we have to skip. Uh, um, Kirsten in the meantime, but maybe we can have, uh, I think Laura has a, has a slot, right? I don't have it in front of me. Oh. Sure. Um, I think Rebecca is. Right, Rebecca. Is Rebecca here? I don't see her. Me neither. But it says 25, so probably. Okay. Uh, well, I guess. I, I can't see not on. Oh, there she is. Great. Oh, this is working. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let's share my screen. Um. And Peter, if all else fails, I do have a copy of Kirsten's slides. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I don't know if I'm sharing something. Not yet, not yet. I think you have to click on this thing next to the camera, microphone, and the screen thing. At the bottom, at least that's where it is in my. Uh. <laughs> at the at the at the bottom is there's four icon icons, uh, a camera, a microphone, a screen, and the uh, gear. Oh. Well. <laughs> Oh. 
Hmm. It's not allowing me to share anything. So um, I guess I'll go ahead with that, the slides, if that's OK. Sure. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Rebecca Abergel. I am the equity advisor for uh, the nuclear engineering department, and I was just going to talk to you very briefly about our principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the department. Um, so I apologize as my slides are not showing up. I'm not sure why, but as Rachel mentioned, this is the first time we're using this platform, so a new thing every time. Um, so in the department, we have about, more or less, this is a ballpark number, but we have about 80 uh, graduate students and about 80 undergraduate students and this varies um, a little bit uh, depending on each year and the rate of graduation of people um, but also as she mentioned we see a lot of diversity within the department at all levels uh, including in socioeconomic background um, in degree goal and in research interests in study focus and in, in age gender ethnicity health. Um, so a lot of things to consider. And uh, this means that you will be meeting, um, interacting with a lot of very different people that come from sometimes extremely different backgrounds um, in all aspects um, from your own background. And so this is important as we want to emphasize that the department as a whole is committed to making sure you evolve in an equitable, inclusive and safe environment. And we are very much committed to everyone's personal development and everyone's academic success. And so this is really, what is most important to us is that you spend the next few years in um, an environment that allows you to strive and to really evolve um, towards your own goals. There are a lot of principles of community um, defined by the University of California, and we're following those principles of community. They reflect um, a certain passion in academia for critical inquiry, for debate, for discovery, and for innovation. And um, every member of our community, not only at a department level, but at the college level at the, and at the university level, as a role in making sure that everyone evolves in this safe, caring, and human environment. And so, again, this is where everybody plays a role, not only faculty, administrators, but really everyone at all levels, including students and staff um, and anyone who visits campus. And we want to make sure we place honesty and integrity, um, again, at all levels in teaching, learning, research, and administration. Um, and that we recognize all of the differences um, amongst people um, and we recognize um, the link between diversity and excellence uh, in, in all of our activities on campus. So I will point you later to um, a web page on our uh, website in the department. But first I want to emphasize that um, as you come in this department, there are a lot of things that you will be um, uh, seeing, but you want to know uh, who you are working with, who you're studying with, and so that includes knowing the faculty. And so again, I will, I don't have the um, slides showing up, but I will refer you to our website, so the Nuclear en Engineering Department website. There is a faculty tab where you can see all of the faculty. You should know everyone. You should know your professors um, from whom you're taking classes, and you should know the professors and the advisors that you can talk to regarding any issues um, pertaining to classes or research or um, career development and, and know that you should, you, sh you should feel free to reach out to them. Um, so there's, there's a list of faculty on the website and, and take some time to know them. Um, nobody will turn you uh, back. Everybody will try to answer you as quickly as they can. Sometimes it, it takes some time. Uh, and if you don't get any response, uh, do insist, um, because people do get overwhelmed. Um, in addition to the faculty, you want to know the staff in our department, um, because they help run pretty much everything. <laughs> and so they're very important uh, 
people you will be working with and, and um, will be talking to over the next few years. And so you've already met Kirsten on, on this platform. Um, she's probably the most important. Um, Alan Boland, who is our safety uh, officer. Um, and there are a few other people. Oh, so I, I won't list your names. Um, again, I don't have the slides, but um, they are in our uh, department office. So whenever we'll be in person, this will be uh, on the fourth floor of Echeverry Hall on campus, uh, where we are pretty much all located. But again, if you go to the uh, department website, you should be able to look at all the staff and recognize that those are resources for you and you should feel free to reach out to them. There is also a website, uh, a web page on equity and inclusion, also that you can find through the tabs on the department website. And this has all of the resources that were already mentioned by Rachel, but that are important to making sure that you feel safe um, as you're undergoing um, your studies um, and that you know that there are a lot of resources available. And that includes campus wide resources in terms of um, health services care center um, and all of the resources that are um, important for the prevention of harassment and discrimination. There is a uh, gender equity resource center and a well-being center. And so all of those are linked to through our equity and inclusion page. And you should um, right now try to bookmark this page on your devices and, and explore the different links so that you know where to find them if you ever needed them. Um, because chances are someone is going to need one of these links at some point um, throughout their student career in the department. And so you should know at least where to find them, even if it's um, just to know they're available and or to redirect other students, um, other people you interact with. In terms of uh, campus initiatives, policies, um, and data, there are also a few links that we are providing you with. That includes the general campus diversity statement um, and also resources for uh, plans for accommodations. And so that would be for students with certain disabilities. Um, it links you to the Office for the Prevention of Harassment and Discrimination, as I said. It links you to a code of student conduct, the code of faculty conduct, um, and the general ca campus diversity, equity, and inclusion webpage. Um, there are other resources, um, just in general, for legal services, grievance procedures, um, the, the health service centers, the tank center, counseling services, and all sorts of um, undergraduate student programs um, that are available to you. And so again, there are a lot of resources, but you should um, maybe take some time to explore um, what is available. And so we've, we've tried to group everything so that it's, you can find them all in one place. This page also provides you with a link to the mental health um, UC Berkeley handbook, which is really important, especially under the current circumstances. Um, it, is, it, it is sometimes difficult to go through undergraduate school, um, but it may make it even more difficult, especially um, now that we're all at home, we're working on computers, um, everybody, some people may feel really isolated and, and may really benefit from interactions uh, with counselors or for some kind of help that you can find in there. And so again, take some time to browse through this digital handbook on mental health, um, that, that may be helpful. Um, we also have a climate advisory committee in the department. Um, we had a roster for last semester, um, keep an eye out for the recruitment, the recruitment announcement for this fall, um, as we need a few more students to join the committee. This committee is so that it provides a platform for you to communicate any concerns or any ideas you have for the department. And so if you don't feel comfortable talking to a faculty, you may find a student, an undergraduate student or a graduate student on the committee that you feel more comfortable talking with, who will relay uh, your ideas or concerns um, to the committee and to the department. Um, so again, that will come up as an announcement if you're interested in joining as well. Um, we also have a feedback form on the website, which is really important for us as we, again, are trying to make sure you have a positive, enriching experience in the department. And so if you have issues, anything um, that is concerning that you want to report, the feedback form can be anonymous if you wish so, um, so you don't have to identify yourself. 
you can identify yourself when you make a comment if you want us to follow up. Um, and so that's a choice you make when you fill up the feedback form. But again, this is available through the website on one of the tabs um, on the um, far right of the website. Um, and so finally, as Rachel mentioned, we have a weekly colloquium from the department on Mondays from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, you are welcome to attend this colloquium. This is usually um, an expert in some technical um, field in science, nuclear science and engineering. So you'll hear about state of the art research and technologies. Um, but importantly, this year we're starting a new parallel discussion. So those speakers will um, exchange um, thoughts with students on the next day. So on Tuesdays from 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. and discuss career path in their respective organizations. So you, you have an idea of um, what a career in nuclear engineering fields um, may look like based on what those um, speakers have gone through. Um, and so again, those, those will be announced every week through our department newsletter. Keep an eye on, on this and uh, don't hesitate to join those seminars and those discussions. They're really made for the students and for you to be exposed to um, all of these resources and all of these experts um, in the field. So I think that's all I had. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. There are a lot of things in the chat, so <laughs> just catching up here. No more questions? I will link you through the um, DEI page of the department on the chat so that you can bookmark it right away um, and start exploring. And so I guess, Alan, you're next on the agenda. Yes, I think I am. Uh, are you able to see me and hear me? Wonderful. Yes. OK. Uh, well, then, um, thank you, Rebecca. I uh, appreciate that. Um, my name is Alan Boland. I'm the safety coordinator for the nuclear engineering department. I also am safety coordinator for the entire college, but uh, today we're focusing on nuclear engineering. Um, so welcome to our session. And uh, I'm going to share my slides right now. Okay. Uh, someone who has audio, uh, can you tell me if you can see the slides? Yes. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, let me uh, run through this and tell you some pertinent safety information uh, for you as new undergraduate students in nuclear engineering. There are three levels of safety um, that I'm going to talk about today. There's the campus level, the building level, and the department level. So at the campus level, we've got campus-wide safety. We've got a few organizations that handle uh, safety for the entire campus. The first is the UC Police Department, and it's a sub-organization, the Office of Emergency Management. Then there is the Office of Environment, Health, and Safety. They handle all of the research safety and office safety like ergonomics. At the building level, uh, nuclear engineering is in Echeverry Hall. So we've got two aspects to building safety. We have the building emergency plan, and we have safety meetings four times a year that include uh, representatives from the entire building, not just nuclear engineering, but also mechanical engineering and industrial engineering and operations research. And then thirdly, at the departmental level, we have uh, nuclear engineering safety. We have the principal investigators through the lab context and the department safety coordinator, who is me. So I'm going to talk about these three levels uh, in this order. Let's begin with the campus wide safety and the UC Police Department. So you should know that the UCPD is a one stop shop for all kinds of emergencies. Yes, they are police, but they are also fire 
and ambulance. And if you need to reach them, you would call 911 from a landline phone, or you would call this strange number here from a mobile phone, 642-3333. The reason you would not call 911 from your mobile phone is because if you do call 911 from your mobile phone, you will go to the California Highway Patrol. Sorry about that notice. And uh, the California Highway Patrol will then spend five minutes trying to figure out that you actually ought to be talking to UCPD. And that's time wasted and lost in a life-threatening emergency. So uh, put this number into your mobile phone under UCPD or emergency so that you can uh, call it when you need to. Also, you would call UCPD if you do something mundane, like lock yourself out of your lab or office. You wouldn't call the life-threatening emergency number 911. You would call this number here. And this is monitored 24 hours a day, and they're happy to help you with uh, any questions or concerns that you may have. Another thing you should do uh, regarding UCPD is um, enroll your mobile phone for warmly text messages. As a new student, you're automatically enrolled for your email for Warn Me, uh, but you should also enroll your mobile phone for text message. And uh, this is the, the link, uh, warnme.berkeley.edu. You can also get to this website through the UCPD homepage. We have uh, several blue light boxes in Echeverry Hall from which you can call UCPD. Uh, on the third floor, we have two boxes, uh, one at either end of the breezeway um, on the third floor, but they're, they're outside. On the second floor, we have this one on the inside. This is a close-up view of it. This is in the east-west hall on the second floor. And on the first floor in the north-south main hallway towards the north end, we have the blue light box here. There's a button on that that you press, and then you can get a direct line to the 911 line for UCPD. So that concludes for UCPD. Let me also mention the sub-organization of UCPD called the Office of Emergency Management. OEM helps us prepare for earthquakes and other disasters that may happen on campus. Um, this is all I'm going to say about OEM to you because you won't usually have uh, an occasion or a reason to interface with OEM directly. I will mention though that the OEM website which you can also get to through the UCPD main page, uh, has some information about how you can prepare as an individual person for a major earthquake and what to do in that case. But other than that, that's all I'm gonna say about OEM. So we've talked about those two organizations. Now we're gonna focus on the Office of Environment, Health and Safety. EHS handles all research and office safety for campus. They are the main organization and they have a bunch of experts. I don't know if this font is too small for you to, to read, but I'll just read some of it for you. They handle things like biosafety, chemical safety, diving safety, environmental protection, uh, fire prevention, lasers, radiation. Uh, Key thing I do want to point out is that EHNS also handles the UC Learning Center for us. So if you uh, have some problems with the UC Learning Center where you're supposed to take some training course, be whatever it may be, um, you can come to this uh, homepage for EHNS, click on this link, training, and it'll have a link to uh, both the UC and an email address, ehstrain at berkeley.edu you can email that address and they will help you solve your problems with UC Learning Center. We'll talk more about EHNS when we get to um, the department level safety. Well, I have one more thing, I guess, on EHNS, which is that the campus has a workplace safety program. Uh, this satisfies California state law, Cal OSHA law. Um, and every employee must uh, take this training course, and every affiliate who does research must take this training course. If you, as a student, never set foot in a laboratory, are never paid as an employee in any way, and you only take classes, you don't have to do this training. But if any of those things uh, do apply to you while you're here, you must take the Workplace Safety Program training. Uh, so there's training and then the, the safety program is a safety structure. 
What I'm showing here is the Workplace Safety Program uh, homepage on the EHNS website, uh, which has a bunch of um, different aspects to it. But there's also a link right here, again, maybe too small for you to read, uh, a link to the online course. I will go to that next. Uh, here's a, a, a screenshot of the UC Learning Center page with EHS 502 Workplace Safety Program training courses here. Um, and so it's on the UC Learning Center. It's in three different languages, English, Spanish, and Chinese. And pick whichever one you want, they all count. It's about 20 minutes long, it's a video, and it uh, has all sorts of aspects of safety, including what to do if you or someone else gets injured. Um, it includes things like night safety walks. If uh, you're working late on campus and uh, you need to get home safely, it talks about that. Uh, so it's a broad spectrum of safety related things. I highly recommend that you just go ahead and take it and get it out of the way. Uh, it's a one and done, you do it once and you're finished for the rest of your career at UC Berkeley. And uh, that way you'll know what kind of safety resources are available to you of different types. So that concludes the campus-wide safety. Now let's focus on building safety for Echeverry Hall, which includes the building emergency plan and the quarterly safety meetings. So first, the building emergency plan. Every building on campus has a building emergency plan. Uh, I've included a screenshot of what it, what it looks like, a typical one. This is the one for our building at Javeri Hall. Uh, it's a PDF that's available online. And all occupants of the building who are employees or who do research must uh, read this and then print, sign, date the uh, compliance sheet that is located in the nuclear engineering front office. If you, again, if you're a student who only ever takes classes in Echeverry Hall and you never have any sort of office here or anything like that, you wouldn't need to know this. But if you're an employee or do any sort of research, you must read this and then print sign date. It's rather dry, I have to confess. Um, to get to the building emergency plan, uh, there's a collection of them that are on the Berkeley Engineering, College of Engineering uh, website and you would go to about and facilities and building emergency information and then click on this link down here which says building emergency plans. You must have a CalNet uh, ID, which all of you will eventually if you don't already. You log in and uh, you can pick the BEP for Echeverry Hall and uh, read the PDF. And then when you're on campus, whenever that may be, we don't know yet, uh, you could come to the front office and print sign date the sheet that's there. I will point out, precisely because the BEP is long and dry, that the most pertinent, pertinent and useful information is actually on these multicolored signs that are posted next to the elevators inside Echeverry Hall. So I recommend, yes, read the BEP because you're supposed to, you have to, you're required to, but to actually understand what in the world is going on, take a moment sometime when you're, while you're waiting for the elevator to read this sign and you'll get the most important gist of the information. Couple specific things that I wanna tell you about the BEP for Echeverry Hall is that uh, in an emergency, if there's an evacuation such as a fire alarm or an earthquake happens and you leave the building, go to the two ends of Echeverry Hall on the north side by Ridge Road or on the south side by Hearst Avenue and collect there and you will receive instructions what to do from there. Uh, please do not stay in the breezeway between Echeverry Hall and Soda Hall and Jacobs Hall. Don't stay there. And don't stay in the alley next to Echeverry Hall. The reason is that you're too close to the buildings and stuff could fall off of the building, glass could break and fall into the alley and hit you. So move out of the alley and congregate at the ends of the building. I'll also mention that we have an automatic external defibrillator or AED right here uh, at the north end of the third floor. There's also this cabinet that includes a disability evacuation chair, which you would not normally need to use. That's more for uh, emergency personnel, but I'm just letting you know that these things exist. Now let's talk about quarterly safety meetings for the whole building. Again, they're building wide. It includes people from mechanical, people from industrial engineering, and people from us, nuclear engineering. We have them four times a year. 
Uh, they occur on the second Tuesday of these months, January, April, July, and October. We're pretty consistent. Um, not everyone needs to attend, but only a representative from every office group and every lab group. So the key takeaway for you is that you should be getting your safety information from your group contact. So if you join a research group and you attend the group meeting uh, four times a year after the, the quarterly safety meeting, your lab group contact should make a short presentation saying, this is the stuff that we learned at the quarterly safety meeting and here's how it applies to you. That's all I'll say about that. Let's talk about departmental safety. So in the nuclear engineering department, we've got three levels of safety. We have the principal investigators who are legally in charge and who are telling you, do this research, this is what's going on, this is what you need to do. Um, but on a day-to-day -day level, uh, I have found that usually the lab contacts uh, know more of the details of what are what's going on. And many times, actually, the principal investigators will delegate to the lab contacts to say, hey, take care of managing the lab rosters and the safety aspects of the lab. So uh, lab contacts are your main, main people to know about safety. Uh, and then there's the department safety coordinator. I kind of fill in the gaps and make sure that everything is running smoothly. So I'm your department safety coordinator. When you join a research group, assuming that you do, have your lab contact help you with the onboarding process and the safety training. Uh, I will just mention here, EHS, the website and the UC Learning Center, that's where you're going to take most of your training courses for research safety and for all the other kind of safety. So we have talked about these three levels of safety on the campus level, on the building level, on the department level. This is how we communicate safety information to you so that you can do your research safely and can be here safely on campus. I'm going to briefly mention two things that are special safety situations that we're going through now. One on the left is the COVID-19. Uh, what I've included here is a screenshot of the main coronavirus uh, resource and support page on the main UC Berkeley website. So you would click on that and come here. There's a dashboard. There's also a daily symptom screener. And so this is information for if you would ever have to come to campus this fall, uh, you would need to do the symptom screener for the day, you'd have to take the COVID-19 training. I'm not anticipating that you'll have to do that, but if you do, you can contact me, you can talk, contact your PI to figure out what things you need to do to be able to come to Echeverry Hall or to come on campus. The second thing is that we've got some wildfires right now, we've got some smoke. Uh, EHNS actually doesn't handle wildfire smoke. This is through the Tang Center, through the University Health Services. They have a whole web page here about wildfire smoke and air quality. So if you have any questions about that, go to their website and they will tell you. So in conclusion, here are the action items for you to do as new students. Number one, put that special emergency 911 number into your mobile phone for UCPD. It's right there, 510-642-3333. Secondly, Go to that Warn Me website and enroll your mobile phone for text messages. Um, third, take the EHNS 502 Workplace Safety Program. You're going to have to do it if you ever do any research, um, and you might as well just do it because it provides a lot more safety information uh, that you can use. And once you do it, you're done for the rest of your career at the university. Uh, you will have to read the Echeverry Hall Building Emergency Plan which is available as a PDF on the College of Engineering website. You're gonna to have to print sign date the BEP sheet in the NE front office next time you're on campus and in the building, whatever that may be. When you join a research group, find out who is your lab contact and that person will start you on a safety training. And lastly, talk with your lab contact or PI or last resort, you can contact me if you want to come to campus because you're gonna to have to follow the COVID-19 policies. I recommend if you can see this slide on your computer screens right now and you know how to take a screenshot, take a screenshot right now and that way you'll have this to-do list and you can run through it and get this all done. It won't take you very long. So I'll leave this on here for a moment and then I will flip over to uh, answer any questions. Good. Okay. Are there any questions in the chat?
Let's see. Yes, okay, Laura has listed the uh, number for the non-emergency line and the coronavirus and uh, uh, wildfire uh, websites that are on the, um, on the pages there. Uh, ah, where do you go to take the EHS 502 Workplace Safety Program? That is a very good question. You go to the um, UC Learning Center, which, um, let me see if I can just go ahead and do that for you. Hold on, I'm going to see if I can bring up another browser and uh, share the screen with you. Give me a moment. Ah, where do you enroll your numbers for Warmy? So you would go to the UCPD website, which you can get to from uh, the Berkeley homepage, type in UCPD on the search, go to UC Police Department, and you'll find a link there for that. Okay, let me, ah, Laura, yes, okay, you have listed it there. Very good, yes, that, that'll answer it, sure. I don't think I need to, to, to walk you through it. Any other questions? You're welcome. Okay, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, otherwise, I guess it's the next person, whoever that may be. Whoever our next speaker is, come online and share your video and audio. Um, hey, Laura, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, thanks, Alan. That was a great presentation. If you ever do research in person, Alan is definitely like a good contact to know for that stuff. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Laura. She I use she, her, her pronouns. And um, I am the current president of the UC Berkeley chapter of the American Nuclear Society. And I am a third year studying nuclear engineering with a minor in public policy. So first and foremost, I just wanted to say welcome and congratulations. Um, I know that this is a very weird time, but um, I'm glad that you have all decided to enroll and hopefully um, with ANS, you can come out to some events and things will um, try to be a little bit more normal. So what is ANS? ANS is, uh, like I mentioned, the student chapter of the National American Nuclear Society Organization, which is a not-for-profit international scientific and educational organization. At UC Berkeley, our mission is to promote the development of nuclear science and technology through community engagement, professional connections, and the exchange of knowledge. And for this, um, throughout the semester, we'll host professional development, academic development, outreach, and social events. So ANS has no membership dues or application or recruitment process. Um, all interested members are welcomed and encouraged to come to our events. And at the end of this, I'll share the mailing list slide so people can sign up uh, to get our emails. So for the first tenant of what our club does, professional development um, is really a great resource, especially for younger students, since within the nuclear engineering department, due to like different ABET requirements, um, a lot of students don't take classes with other nuclear engineers or like nuclear engineering specific classes until a little bit later towards the end of their sophomore year or beginning of their junior year. So as a result, being a part of ANS helps you gain exposure to the nuclear industry by having um, talks from different companies um, come. And this year, even though it will be virtual, we'll still have hopefully three to four talks um, two from two startups, one that came out of the UC Berkeley uh, labs from Dr. Per Peterson, Kairos Power and Alameda. And then the second um, that came from a physics professor uh, called Deep Isolation, which is based in Berkeley. 
Uh, additionally, we'll have a representative from General Atomics, which is like a uh, utilities, and they do some fusion research in San Diego. Uh, another thing uh, to prepare for these talks, we'll also have LinkedIn and resume workshops. And then in the past, we've done professional headshots uh, when we're in person. Secondly, for academic development, like I mentioned before, to help gain more exposure, we'll host tours of campus labs and research opportunities within the nuclear engineering department. Through these research opportunities, um, a lot of undergraduates gain mentorship from either older undergraduates or graduate students, and also get some exposure to research and industry connections um, and also with national labs. Oh, sorry, I have two slides going. Um, so this was the academic development slide. Uh, so for outreach, um, the main thing we do in the fall is there's this national campaign called Nuclear Science Week, where we strive to um, increase awareness about nuclear science and nuclear technologies and just like how diverse it is. Um, so in the past, we've hosted events like a faculty luncheon and then on-campus lab tours and a game of Jeopardy. Um, additionally, for outreach, um, we do some local school demonstrations and lessons, and we're hoping to expand that to go to more high schools in the region. Uh, so lastly, a big part of ANS is the community that you gain from joining the group. So we host social events. Um, one of our favorite traditions is our kickoff karaoke night. Um, we also host study jams, which are, um, we will be hosting these virtually for students to um, have a space to study with others, but also um, to have a little bit of peer tutoring for older undergraduates who've already taken the class you've taken to offer some assistance with like homework or understanding any concepts. Um, and then uh, we'll have someone a little bit later talk about the any department mentorship program, which links up um, older undergraduates and then newer incoming freshmen or transfer students, um, and also with graduate students. So here is a tentative schedule of our events for fall 2020. And I would just like to highlight these first two events, um, the NE Trivia Night and the ANS First General Meeting. For the NE Trivia Night, we're teaming up um, with some graduate students who thought it'd be a good idea to build a sense of community and get um, just people like to have some fun before the semester like gets into full gear. So um, I would encourage you to uh, take a picture of this or um, sign up later for this event um, just to get to know people and have a good time. So next, I think um, we have someone, Kaylee Connect, who's going to talk about the mentorship program. Uh, Kaylee, are you able to join the panel? Yes. Can you hear me? Cool. OK, cool. Um, so I'm Kaylee Connect. I'm a graduate student in the department. Um, and I want to talk to you about an initiative we've been working on called the Fission Products Mentoring Program. Um, so the idea of this program is you sign up and you will be paired with a mentor, either an upperclassman, undergraduate, or a graduate student in the department. Um, throughout the semester, wait, can people still hear Kaylee? Oh no, okay, Kaylee, there were two of you, so I tried to remove one, which was a bad idea. Kaylee, can you try to rejoin? Oh, that's a good idea, Grant, if you want to get rid of the echo. <laughs> Andrew, it's so rude. <laughs>
All right, is this better? Okay, cool. Um, where was I? Okay, cool. Um, so you get paired up with a mentor and throughout the semester you meet up with your mentor and complete a number of goals. Um, so these goals can be any number of things. We have a few listed on this slide. Um, so one thing that we're gonna require everyone to do is to help form our community guidelines. Um, so we've developed sort of um, some starter guidelines, but we want to make sure that we come together as a community and decide um, what our values are and make sure that we're maintaining um, respectful and um, constructive dialogue throughout the program. So that's one thing we are going to require everyone to work on with us. Um, but other than that, there are a number of um, professional development goals that you can complete with your mentor. Um, so one of those is making a resume. That's something really valuable that you um, might not have experience with, but people that are further in the program have definitely done before and can help show you the ropes on how to do that. You can also practice interviewing, which is super valuable no matter what you want to do with your career. It's good to have those skill sets underneath your belt. Um, you can make an elevator pitch, also important no matter which direction you go with. You might not even know what an elevator pitch is. So you'll be connected with someone that can help you learn how to do all of these things. And if none of the goals that I listed interest you, you're also allowed to form your own goals. Um, so if there's anything that you're wanting to work on in your first semester that your mentor wants to help you with, you're fully allowed to do that and um, count it towards the program. Uh, the other component of this program are meetups. So um, we're in a virtual format this semester, this year maybe. Um, so maybe one day you'll be able to meet up for coffee or to study an etch, but for now we are counting Zoom meetings, phone calls, Slack calls, maybe even long form emails, just whatever works for you right now in our current circumstance, um, we're willing to be very flexible. So the, the perks of this program, so if you see at the top it says goals plus meetups equals rewards. Um, there's a few, I guess, um, non-physical rewards, right? So um, you'll be able to form meaningful relationships with your mentors and kind of get plugged into the department a little bit better, which might be a little bit more difficult to do now than in normal circumstances. So this is a good way to kind of integrate yourself into the department and find a friend. Um, you can also work on these key professional and academic development goals. And um, in general, you'll have access to a larger network of mentors outside of the one that you're assigned to. Um, so you'll be able to join our Slack channel and on there we'll have um, alumni, so actual professionals working in the field, as well as all the other mentors and mentees in the program where you can ask for advice in like a quick, casual way um, and maybe even get connected to other mentors in less formal program way. Um, so yeah, in addition to all of that, we do reward um, successful pairs at the end of the semester. Um, so we're gonna send out a little bit more guidelines to people that are interested, but in general, um, we ask that you complete one goal per month and meet up with your mentor once per month as well. Um, and the pairs, we, we haven't formalized those guidelines yet, but um, the pairs that successful complete all of those requirements will be rewarded at the end of the semester. And I guess stay tuned to figure out what that reward will be. Last semester, we gave um, t-shirts to um, the pairs that met up the most times and completed the most goals. Um, so we have a timeline. Um, we're, the sign-up forms are live now, but they're gonna close in two weeks on um, Friday, sorry, um, Friday, September 11th at 11.59 p.m., so right before midnight. Um, it says September 12th under timeline, that's a mistake. Um, and then the following week, we're going to have an ice cream social over Zoom where you can um, call in and meet all the other participants in the program and maybe find a few different mentors that you're interested in. And then after the ice cream social, we'll send out a, um, a Google form where you can indicate your top five preferred mentors. And after that, we will um, go through and match you up um, with your mentor, which we will do based on your preference. But also when you fill out these sign up forms, you're gonna answer several questions on like what you're looking to get out of the program, 
um, what you like to do for fun, your academic interests, things like that. So we'll try to um, match you up based on preference and also interests. Um, another thing to mention is, um, oh yeah, we're, we're sending out pairs in early October, so after you, you fill out the preference form. But um, for signups, you can sign up to be both a mentor and a mentee. We do ask that you fill out both of the forms if you wanna do both. So for example, if you're a transfer student and you would like to have a mentor to help you transition to Berkeley, but also you feel comfortable serving as a mentor for a freshman, feel free to fill out both of the forms. It's totally allowed. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's everything. <laughs> Are there any questions? Laura, is there anything else that I might've missed? Um, did you mention the preference form, how like you'll meet people at the social and you can say like, what mentor you prefer based on their interests? Yeah, um, so I guess a little bit more detail in our plans for the ice cream social. Um, so when the mentors fill out this form, they're gonna give some like biographical details about like their past experience, their hobbies, things like that. And we're going to distribute that information to the mentees beforehand. Um, so you can get a good idea of like who the different mentors are. Um, then you can come to the to the social, meet um, the different mentors, and if you can't make it, you'll still have access to all of the um, the biographical details. So you can um, still indicate your preference just based off of that alone. Um, and then after the ice cream social, um, we'll just have like a Google form with like a five, um, it'll be like a drop down menu, you can pick like your top five um, preferred and then we'll try to match you with one of your top five favorites. Is that clear it up? Yeah, that's good. that's really good. Um, and you're probably wondering how we're gonna have an ice cream social. Uh, we too are wondering that. We will figure that out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, just some last things about ANS. Um, we'd love to stay connected. So uh, this email will go directly um, to me if you have any questions. Um, additionally, uh, please sign up for our mailing list. Um, we'll be releasing emails every Monday um, for reminders of events coming up and also any opportunities that we get forwarded uh, within the department. We also have a Slack channel um, and a calendar and a website, but a lot of these things are pretty interconnected. Uh, well, thank you all for listening. Uh, please comment any questions that you may have. Um, for Samuel, can we do virtual karaoke? Uh, perhaps there just would have to be lots of uh, muting and unmuting, but I like that idea. So if there are no questions about ANS, um, I guess, do we want to move on to the next thing, the student panel? Uh, welcome. I am joining, assuming that we are starting the student panel. Yeah, um, so. I think because we don't have that many spots, only nine people can do it, and there are eight student panels lists, I ask that anyone who's not a panelist um, leave being on the panel. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're just waiting for key. Wait, Andrew Dong, I can't hear you. 
<laughs> well, um, while they're getting that set up, I guess, um, wait, Andrew, try to talk. Test, microphone okay. test. I think um, he, but I don't know if he's here. Well, he's not here. <laughs> okay. Um, so Kirsten asked me to help moderate. Um, I was thinking we could just go around and say our name, our pronouns, our year at UCB NE undergrad, um, our major or minor or joint, um, and like a fun club you were involved with and any research experience that you may have. And then after that, we'll take questions and you can do questions like, oh, I have a specific question for Chris in the chat. You'll have to specify which Chris. There are two of us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go first, even though I already introduced myself. Um, I'm Laura. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a third year nuclear engineering major, public policy minor. Um, I was previously involved in Dr. Per Peterson's thermal hydraulics lab uh, for my freshman year and then into the summer going into my sophomore year. Um, and then I recently got involved with the applied nuclear physics group uh, with LBL and Dr. Bethany Goldblum and Dr. Lee Bernstein. And this summer I worked um, as a remote intern at TerraPower, which is a startup company in Bellevue, Washington. And a club that I'm involved with um, that's like non-nuclear is the Basic Needs Center, which helps uh, people who have like housing or food insecurity um, and also runs the food pantry. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Uh, Chris, I see your question. I'll get to it once uh, everyone's been introduced. Uh, so I'm Chris Lamb. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm in my final semester at my undergrad. I took a semester off, so my senior year's kind of been shifted a little bit, but yeah, this is the end of my senior year. I will likely be here for my graduate, still need to do the application, and then also I will be here in the spring kind of just doing research. On my research side, I work with uh, Professor Kai Vetter in the radiation detection and imaging side of things. Um, I joined DoseNet Radwatch at the end of my freshman year, so I've been a part of that for just over three years now. And starting in January of this year, I got my own research project in radiation imaging. So I've been working on that in the downstairs of Echeverry. Uh, whoever's next? Uh, Chris F., do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um... Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so my name is Chris Forsyth. Um, I use him and his pronouns. Um, I am going to be a junior this year. My majors, I'm actually doing a joint major. So I'm, um, I'm involved in both mechanical engineering and nuclear engineering. Um, in terms of research experience, um, like Laura, I was also involved in the uh, thermal hydraulics lab with Per Peterson starting, uh, I think, second semester of my freshman year. Um, outside of that lab group, uh, this summer I did a virtual internship at Argonne National Laboratory studying um, micro reactors. Um, in terms of like club experience outside of American Nuclear Society, um, I have a little bit of involvement in some musical activities um, outside of ANS. So I was part of the Cal Marching Band uh, my freshman year. I didn't do it last year. I was thinking about rejoining it, but obviously um, those activities have been canceled. Um, so yeah, looking forward to being able to do some music again uh, in the future. Samuel, would you like to go? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Samuel Varghese. I'm a fourth year nuclear engineering major um, here at Berkeley. I use the he, him series uh, 
see, on the research side of things, I work with Professor Fratoni in his Neutronics Laboratory doing reactor design. Uh, this summer, I started a project with him. Um, we're working with Lawrence Livermore National Labs on fuel cycles and PWRs. Um, and a fun group that I was involved with that's non-nuclear related, um, I was started a team with the Cali Sports program here at Cal. <laughs> Um, Andrew, do you want to go next? All right, cool. So, hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm a sixth-year student. Um, as a second-year graduate student, I was here for undergrad for four years as well. Um, I was a Nuki MSc joint major when I was here in undergrad. Um, I used he, his, him pronouns. Um, and the groups I was involved with were ANS, which you saw Laura talk a lot about, um, the Engineering Student Council for a little bit, and then predominantly uh, CalSol, the solar car team. So, uh, and then for research, I work under Professor Peter Hoseman uh, doing nuclear materials related research. Um, and yeah. Uh, Spira, do you want to go next? If you're talking, we can't hear you. No. I saw the microphone. Oh, 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 you're good, you're good. And I didn't do anything. Um, hi, my name is Spira. Um, I am a sophomore, second year in nuclear engineering. Pronouns are the he series. Um, as for research, last semester I was involved in the Alavisados group. They're like um, semester long research program and currently I'm applying to a couple other positions right now. Um, and then for a fun group I'm involved with, um, I'm on the Quidditch team. So, you know, if you ever see us on the Glade running around with brooms, yep, that's me. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, he, do you want to finish us up? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is He. Uh, my pronouns is He, him. Uh, so I'm a seven year PhD. No, I'm a seven year student going on eight. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I graduated in 2017 uh, in uh, a joint major between nuclear engineering and material science and engineering. And I went on to do a PhD with Professor Peter Hosman in nuclear material. And one group, fun, one fun group. Uh, so I, I joined this group called Chaos. So we do, we do a lot of hiking and backpacking. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I'll answer Christopher's question um, for Chris Lamb. You were talking about DoseNet slash RavWatch. What's it like? Do you get to travel to different places? Yeah, so DoseNet RavWatch, as uh, Peter Hoseman had introduced uh, previously, it's a, a network of sensor systems where we get to install these little boxes across mainly high schools. That's uh, mainly what our work has consisted of. Uh, so traveling, we get to go to high schools, mainly in the Bay Area. In the past, before I joined, they had had trips out to Japan, and uh, I think it was mainly Japan. But there are uh, sensors installed in Sweden and Serbia and Germany, and there's sensors all over the world. But um, most of the travel that we get to do is driving around the Bay Area to install these at high schools. And then also we give these little talks educating the high school students about radiation and radiation detection and radiation in the environment, things like that. Most of the work that we do, this so all the stuff I've been talking about is DoseNet side of things. DoseNet is the sensor systems. Um, on the other side of it, RadWatch. Uh, RadWatch was started after Fukushima. And it's mainly a public data set of uh, neutron activated sources that are tested for different isotopes. So most of what we've done is samples of fish and we get to go buy the fish at local fish markets or have trips to the beach and kind of just collect random bits of dirt. And um, then we send that up to the uh, Triga lab in Davis and they irradiate the samples for us. And then we get to do some fun spectral analysis to figure out what's in these samples isotopically. Yeah, so it's a lot of um, coding in Python and data analysis. It's a great place to start 
for basic research because we always have stuff for things to do, for, uh, for students to do. We just had over the summer, um, five high school students join us to do projects that we gave them along with uh, two other college students from, uh, I believe Davis was where they're from. But um, yeah, so we, we always have work that we can uh, give people if anyone is interested in joining as well. Yeah, there's their website. Uh, you can also, I'll send my email here if you're interested in emailing someone about it. So that's my Berkeley email as well. Uh, no experience is required to join as well. You'll learn whatever you need for the position on the job, which makes it a lot nicer. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions uh, from the chat? Um, if not, I guess I'll ask some random questions to the panelists. Oh, wait, great. Um, is the chemical engineering, nuclear engineering dual major still available? Mm. Um, Are you talking about a double major or a joint major? It has to be dual because College of Chemistry is a separate college. Oh, they don't do joint? Right. I think yeah, they do joint I'm not sure. No, uh, I don't remember. But, I, I think um, there's something, but it's becoming harder to do I think so uh i can do a quick search if it has a page on like the college of engineering for entry in 2020 it should still exist um the only thing that some people may caution you about doing joint majors is that they're not a bet accredited as of a few years ago because it just requires like a sample size of enough students um and their performance to do so and a lot of joint majors um, have like single digit class sizes, like uh, students who graduate with that joint major. So as a result, they are not ABED accredited, though that usually doesn't have much bearing on the job that you get later on. There, There is, I just looked yeah. this up, uh, there is a joint major between chemical and nuclear. Yeah, it's apparently administered by the College of Chemistry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if the website is still up to date, then that means it's still up. So I'm guessing yes. Um, so next question is from Stephanie. Uh, is it too early for a freshman slash transfer student to apply for a research position on their first semester? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there's one student in uh, our group, uh, Daniel. He um, he started with us his first semester as a freshman. So you can definitely start. And we, like I said, we had high schoolers and I'm sure uh, in Peter Hosman's group as well, there's also work in materials um, for plenty of undergrad stuff. Andrew, you probably know more about yeah. that. There is yeah. definitely stuff you can do. Um, and it really is up to basically uh, you contacting a lot of the times is um, contacting a professor or if you go to their web pages assuming they're up to date um, you can try also contacting the graduate students but i caution you just in general regarding to any sort of research uh, it's very very variable in terms of response time um, availability uh, timeline frequency etc uh, a lot of the times it's uh, did you email them at a, a good time which is just by chance um, and then some professors, um, I don't think so in our department, but some professors, especially in other departments, um, have like strict application window uh, guidelines and stuff like that and requirements. Um, I'm not personally aware of that in our nuclear engineering department. So chances are you could probably just email the professor or a graduate student and they can hook you up or lead you to the right direction. Um, but yeah. Yeah, in terms of my experience, uh, uh, when I start my freshman year in Berkeley, I applied to two research positions, uh, one in the civil engineering, uh, but the professor got back to me and told me that I should wait for another year and at least have a, a good GPA. Um, 
because they have a different uh, research philosophy. And then I, uh, I didn't really apply to do research in Peter Group. I just walked into the previous chair, the car, say, I want to do research. And he said, what do you like? I say, material science. So it just, car just showed me Peter. And then I've been working for Peter for eight years now. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's, it's never too early. I, I did my, actually in September uh, of my freshman year. Um, yeah. Yeah, and to go off of that for Caleb's question, who do we contact? Um, so like Rebecca mentioned earlier, you can go to the people page and then faculty. Um, additionally, I think there's a, um, here, there's a research page that I will link um, that you can filter based on different uh, nuclear topics. So they have like applied nuclear physics, computational methods, fission reactor design, nuclear materials and stuff. And you can click um, on each of those and it'll show you the professors um, slash like staff researchers who work on that topic. And there's also their email there to reach out to them. Uh, next question from Nolan. What is the difference between doing research through the university and through LBL or another national lab? Uh, yeah, I, sorry. Okay. I, I've done research at uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab. And as far as I can tell, you have to do extra training courses, which are the same training courses, just again, essentially. Um, the main difference is uh, kind of like location, I'd say, is the big one. Um, I'm just speaking in terms of Kai Vetter's group, but Kai's, Kai Vetter's group is pretty ingrained in LBL. So your research is pretty much, if you're doing research with the radiation detection team, you're probably also doing something in terms of LBL research as well. Yeah, so the, the location or lab versus university, a lot of it is tied to the professor themselves, um, namely in terms of where do they have space, where are they conducting research, where are they tied to. Um, so some professors are mainly based in Etcherberry Hall, some professors are mainly based in LBL, and some professors in other places. Uh, yes, you can also do both. Um, so some professors have ties to LBL, Berkeley, Livermore, and in addition to all this, if you do research uh, during the school year, chances are you could probably uh, reach out to whatever PI you're working with and get uh, contacts in terms of some sort of internship regarding either at Berkeley and staying in Berkeley over the summer or at a national lab like Los Alamos or Idaho, um, et cetera. Uh, you'll see basically nuclear engineering students, uh, including undergrads, just all over the map, uh, especially when summer happens um, based on wherever there are internships available and ties to the research departments. Yeah, I think usually the, the trick is that uh, you go, to, you work with a professor and then the professor will send you to a different national lab. So it, it's actually make it a lot easier to get a position at the national lab because the people at national lab always want to continue the pipeline and they rely on the professors to send qualified students there. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question is from Jimmy. Is it stressful to do a joint major or double major as the mandatory courses for later year gets more difficult? All right. <laughs> um, so first of all, in my opinion, um, the joint major isn't necessarily extra work. Basically what a joint major is, is that if you look at the requirements for the degrees, all your technical electives essentially become required courses of your other joint major. So for example, in the nuclear engineering and material science joint major, um, you have like 20 something or 30 something technical electives you have if you're a, a pure nuclear engineer, but that all gets reduced to like 12, I think it was, or nine um, open technical electives and all the other technical electives became material science courses. Um, so basically you just have less options in regards to you know freedom of choosing courses to account towards your major, but if you're already doing that joint major, chances are it's because you're interested in that other joint. Um, so I was gonna take material science classes anyways, because I was interested in that. So the joint major just made sense because I was just gonna take those classes anyways. Um, now, there are some uh, majors that 
don't have joint majors. And as a result, uh, you have to do double. And also, I think it's the College of Engineers pol uh, Engineering's policy that if there is a joint major available for a specific combination of majors, they will push very hard for you to do that joint major rather than double major. Uh, so for example, again, let's say Nuki and material science, um, there's a joint major for that. So they'll push hard for you to do that joint major rather than double major. Um, and that's very, very stressful and difficult because uh, the joint major has roughly the same number of units uh, in terms of what you need to graduate. It's around like 120 or 130, something along those lines. If you double major, you essentially have to double that. Uh, you can overlap, I believe, 13 credits. I think that's what it is, or somewhere around that ballpark. But that's still over 230 units that you'll need uh, to double major. Uh, I guess you get to say that you double major instead of doing a joint major. So yeah, that's the uh, advantage. Like, in reality, like I've said joint major and everyone thinks I'm double majored, even though I haven't. So. Oh, the <laughs> one thing you just, Caleb, you just that don't correct um, them, right? when you have a joint major, you get one diploma that says nuclear engineering and material science and engineering. Those, though, if you double major, you'll get two. So it's all about the amount of yeah, okay, paper yeah. that you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, in my experiences, uh, I, I met a lot of uh, super motivated people from nuclear engineering, and uh, some of them, they did double major because they're just really capable, and I'm sure a lot of you are. And uh, even if you do single major, you have a lot of elective, so you have a lot more, more freedom to take the classes you want. So it's not really necessary that by doing one major, you're going to be tying down to a single major. Um, yeah. That's a good point. A lot of people um, double major with like physics or math because um, the majors in the schools of letters and sciences tend to have fewer requirements and fewer prereqs than those in the College of Engineering. Um, so the next question um, is favorite. <laughs> Wait, I guess we'll address <laughs> whose cat that is first. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so Joe Hui, uh, sorry if I did not say that correctly. Um, so favorite classes. <laughs> uh, wait, is your cat okay? <laughs> my cat is okay. Uh, it's actually not my cat. It's the house cat. And uh, uh, she, she wants attention. So I'm looking at her right now. Oh, wow, there's a lot of questions now. Okay. Oh, boy. Just uh, what is your favorite class that you have taken at Cal? Um, I'll go first. I liked um, any 101 taught by Professor Lee Bernstein, uh, nuclear physics and like um, uh, reactions. I found that really yeah. interesting. And now like when people ask me questions about nuclear things, especially processes, I feel like I can explain them a lot better. Um, I also enjoyed Theater 40, which was an in-person modern dance class. Uh, so I guess I'll go next. Mine's, I always have a hard time because I've been asked this before as well. So I'm going to say like three kind of answers. So first I'm going to go with <laughs> nuclear. I know, Andrew. I, so first I'm going to go with nuclear. My nuclear favorites have kind of been a tie between uh, any 104, which is the required detection lab class. Um, thought take there, uh, uh, tied kind of with any 156, which is nuclear criticality safety. Uh, that was essentially a project class and we got to take a trip to Livermore to see a, uh, subcritical reactor and place fuel rods in the reactor. That was just really cool to do. Um, so non-nuclear STEM class, I really enjoyed material science 102 which is bonding crystallog. I felt like uh, that was taught very well, and I just enjoyed learning the material. I don't know. And then um, non-STEM class, because I think it's important to have that as well. Uh, my favorite is probably the knitting class. So Berkeley offers something called decals. Um, yes, 156. Um, Berkeley offers something called details, which are student taught courses. And these student taught courses are in anything really. 
So knitting, I got to take a class on learned how to knit for units. And then um, <laughs> after, so I took that class my freshman year and then I went on to teach that class for three years, yeah. Uh, it's not being taught this semester, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, but it will probably return in the spring, but not with me teaching it. Um, I, yeah, Berkeley time is a very good course. To um, I guess all guys, so favorite, I'm, I have not taken any nuclear classes yet because I uh, just completed freshman year, but if you have the chance to take any calculus course with Professor Pollen, it is a must. That man is a legend and probably the best lecture I've had so far at Cal. Um, other than Pollen, I would suggest if you can take um, just like a freshman seminar, especially like I took one with Professor Norman in the nuclear department last semester, and that was probably one of the most fun classes I've done so far. They're kind of like one unit, pass, no passes, kind of relaxed, but you get a chance to kind of just interact with professors in a closer way than you would have. I think my favorite STEM course 